Oh, man. Y'all did a great job uh, leading us into worship. If I've not met you, uh, my name is Eric. I serve as the pastor here at Victory City Church. So nice to meet you. If I've met you before, hello. Good to see you in church on a beautiful January Sunday. We're going to go to God's Word as we are in week four of the seven disciplines of a disciple. And uh, we're going to go to Matthew and look at a teaching of Jesus. And then we're going to go to the book of Acts and look at that teaching applied. So if you have your Bibles, you can pull them out, whether it's the brick and mortar version or whether it's a device. Uh, If you don't have it, don't worry. You came to the right place. We're going to put it on the screen. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. I'm going to read. I'm going to try to explain a little bit as I go. Um, Here Jesus teaching. And it says, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. What Jesus is talking about is, is um, earthly rulers will rule in positional leadership. They'll say, I'm the boss, do what I say. They'll use their authority inappropriately. Um, They'll use it in a domineering way. And Jesus is basically saying, that's not me, and that's not going to be us. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And look what he says in verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so that's the principle that Jesus is teaching. Then you go to the book of Acts in chapter 6, and you see a story of this principle playing out. And in verse, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. How many of you guys know sometimes people be complaining in church? Not y'all, but sometimes it happens. Uh, and it's growing. The church is growing, and they're going, what's going on? And sometimes growing churches have different challenges. Um, I'd rather solve those problems than the opposite. And it says, and the 12 summoned the full number of disciples. They say, let's have a family meeting. And he says, it is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. You read that and you first think the disciples are being arrogant. They're saying, hey, I don't want to, that's beneath me. But essentially what the disciples are saying is this, there's too much for us to handle. So if we go to serve the tables, we're not able to preach and teach and study and prepare God's word. So it's kind of one or the other. And it says that they summoned the whole disciple, uh, the whole group of the disciples. And then you see, it says, therefore, brothers, in verse three, pick out from among you seven good men of repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So they pick out the seven men. Let's go to verse 7 to see this conclude. The seven men begin to lead in this space. And in verse 7, and it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples were multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I'd love to title today's message, I Was Voluntold. I was voluntold. Let's pray, and then we'll go into it. God, I pray you're with us. God, I pray you speak to the righteous and to the rebel. God, I pray you speak to those who are passionately pursuing you. And God, I pray you speak to those who are cautiously cynical. Lord, I pray that all of us today, God, are just taking one step, one step closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 All right, grab your seats this morning. Get cozy next to your neighbor. Even if you don't know him, introduce yourself. Say, hey, I'm Eric. Nice to meet you. Our elbows are going to touch a few times, but I'm not weird. I was voluntold. You know what's crazy is um, I've been reading this book in the new year that's kind of messed me up a little bit. Um, Really kind of challenged some paradigms that I have, especially with how I see it uh, connecting with Scripture. And one of the things that that has come out of it is essentially that we are a nation addicted to dope. Um, Most of you here um, probably use dope within the first 10 minutes of you waking up. Um, In fact, the highest rates of dope users use dope about 144 times a day. I, Isaac, you, you're a dope user, and you're a youth pastor. 
Praise God for that. That's maybe why you're able to do it. Um, um, you know, and so that's, that's pretty crazy. And my wife uses dope. Uh, I see it at home. Um, pray for her, guys. Um, probably most of you use dope. The dope I'm talking about is dopamine. And uh, we live in a society and a culture and really a global civilization that is addicted to dopamine. Dopamine is a naturally occurring hormone in your brain that is released uh, whenever you go through pleasurable moments and when you go through painful moments. It's what they call the feel-good hormone um, or a reward chemical in your mind. Um, and the challenge is we now live in a society that's chronically addicted to dopamine, where we now have situations and systems that have learned to hijack the human body and cause you to produce more than your natural level. So many of us are producing more dopamine, two, three, four, five hundred percent uh, than, than we're, you, our body was designed to. In fact, Anna Lemke, who wrote a book called Dopamine Nation, I would recommend that to you, uh, said this, that the smartphone has become the modern day hypodermic needle, meaning it's just straight injection and our normal hormone systems are being hijacked. Uh, that's why social media is acutely designed to maximize the amount of dopamine your mind produces so that you will constantly want to come back to it and come back to it and come back to it. That's why they have devised uh, a system like the forever scroll or the heart or comments or the tags that you get because it's always trying to bring you back in. That's why every social media device curates an algorithm around the things that you like to consume because it wants to bring you back and to get you in a dopamine loop. Uh, they're finding that pornography use is really not down to sexual deviancy as much as it's down to the dopamine hit that you get from viewing pornography. I mean, think about it. To enter into a sexual relationship with another human in a natural way, you would first have to be somebody worthy of entering into a sexual relationship. You would have to court, date, have a conversation, take out to eat, right? Hopefully get married. And then in a biblical way, uh, you know, then you would be able to enter into a sexual relationship. I know today you can just swipe a certain direction, hook up, then you do it. But, but how crazy is it now that our minds are introduced to sexual experiences on an on-demand rate constantly, therefore triggering a dopamine release that is unnatural. The constant news that you're constantly getting of terror and fright and worry, uh, these news agencies know that it creates a dopamine loop in your mind always wanting you back. And, and, and what they're showing is that whether it's the endless videos on YouTube or Net Netflix asking you to watch the next video or Instagram constantly scrolling or Pornhub giving you what you want because you're constantly going there, it has less to do with maybe the acts and more to do with the chemical uh, response in your brain. Now, what would you say that has to do with anything with church and the Bible? Well, here's the deal. God designed you. God designed dopamine. God designed dopamine to be in balance because of pain and pleasure. That's why now we've resorted to biohacking. There's guys that like to take ice baths because, and gals that take ice baths because it releases a dopamine uh, rush in your body. And what's ending up happening is that we are becoming tolerant to the current dopamine levels, so we need more and more and more and more consumption. We are a society that's become addicted to pleasure and pain avoidant. Another way to say it, like I wrote it here, is we are a society that have become pleasure addicted. We only want the feel good, and we don't like to feel bad. This is really challenging for a preacher because sometimes there's things that you come into with Scripture that don't make us feel good. We don't like it. We don't like the way we feel. Um, we, don't, we don't like sometimes the, the challenge that Scripture brings to our paradigms. We don't like uh, sometimes how, how Scripture messes with our modern narratives. We don't like when there's things like sacrifice and, and denial and laying down our lives and and here's the thing, God designed this dopamine release to be balanced between pain and pleasure. So when you're intimate with your spouse, your body releases dopamine because he wants you to go back to your spouse. 
Uh, when you have a good meal uh, and a healthy meal, it releases dopamine so that you continue to eat good food. When you, when you go through difficult situations, there's a dopamine release to help you get through that. But, but the world has found a way to hijack that. And so as a society, we're constantly looking for more and more pleasures. They actually did a study on test rats, and they gave them dopamine. Uh, and here's something crazy. They would press a button for a, a dopamine release. Um, and what ended up happening is that the only way the rats would actually stop is because they would be, become physically exhausted and unable to press the button. Meaning they had no will to stop the dopamine release, they just kept going for it. Can I tell you that we are a nation that is high on our own supply. We produce it. Um, and what I found is that then when you enter this paradigm of dopamine pleasure addicted and you come to a verse like Matthew chapter 16 that says, then he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. Denial and death don't really sound like a pleasurable experience. Can I get an amen? amen. Self-denial is a behavior of a disciple. Self-denial requires pain. But for many of us, we are chemically unable to step into self-denial because of the fact that we are so addicted to the dopamine that pleasure releases. Scientists are saying now that it takes at least a month of pure abstinence from a certain area that we're, we're, we're over addicted to dopamine. So if it's social media, what we do is we try to get clever and we say, I'm not going to look at Instagram anymore, but we just look at YouTube. You ever notice that? That when you deny one space, then you become all of a sudden really addicted to another space. And so it, it can't be trading addictions. Uh, for, for some people, it's, hey, I'm not going to drink alcohol anymore. Well, then they just start smoking weed. Y'all know. So <laughs> some of you are like, yeah, last night. Anyways, here's the thing. We're, we're, scientists are saying to even get back to a normal, healthy level, it takes a month of pure abstinence. During the series, we've looked it's seven disciplines, seven disciplines of a disciple. And so what does it mean to be a disciple? If you're new with us, I'd like to bring you up to speed. When we say disciple here at Victory City Church, here's what we mean. The first characteristic or trait of a disciple is someone who is fully surrendered to Jesus, fully surrendered. And another way of saying this, if God is not Lord of all, God is not Lord at all. So so a disciple is someone that every space of your life, your relationships, your marriage, your money, your time, your entertainment, what you listen to, how you think, all the behaviors is going, I've fully surrendered this to Jesus. The second characteristic of a disciple is someone who is being transformed by Jesus, who is willingly putting themselves in the process of God, deal with me. That's why I love David's prayer when he says, search me, O God. If there is any unclean thing in me, please remove it. A disciple is someone who's going, God, I know I'm not perfect. And can I just tell you, when you become a pastor, you're not automatically perfect. Like God is still constantly working and dealing in my life. And that's what a disciple is going. God, if there's a space in me that doesn't look like you, will you deal with it? And will you help me get there? The third, the third um, kind of behavior of a disciple is someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus. So, so I, I'm, I'm not just moving from consumerism. I have to make the transition to contribution. I don't just consume the good things of God, but now I contribute. And, and anybody who's been radically changed by Jesus, you understand this. You don't want to keep it to yourself. You want to share it. You want to bless. You want to encourage. You want to go, I found this great thing that's called hope. It has a name, and I'd love to tell you about it. So this is what it means to be a disciple. And today, the discipline we're talking about is the discipline of serving. Serving. It's incredibly important to understand that these disciplines are not naturally occurring. So let me just take the pressure off really quick 
If you feel like, I, man, I don't have that one, that's okay. We're all working in a space of going, God, will you help me? And, and for some of you, you know, it could be giving that we talked about last week, or it could have been uh, prayer that we talked about a few weeks ago. These disciplines are things where we're going, hey, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to be intentional about instilling into my life. Y'all with me? So, so I, I'm not perfect. And we have to understand that a, in our own human flesh, our nature, our nature was not necessarily inclined to build for it. That, that's why the scripture says this, that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Meaning, we, we understand spiritually what we need to do, but sometimes it's just hard. Come on. Has anybody ever found living for Jesus a little bit difficult? For those of you who don't live for Jesus, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I found this true. I had a few friends um, who have served in the military. And uh, anybody serve in the military in the house? Can you make a woo-woo? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you for your service. I appreciate that. You are valuable members of our society and valuable members of our church. But one of the things I've learned from friends who have served, I have not, is they said, there's no such thing as volunteering in the military. You're voluntold. Like your CO just walks up, your commanding officer, and says, hey, this is what you're doing. Come on, can anybody in the military, can you attest to that? Can, is, that is that a true thing, right? You, know, you, you don't volunteer. You're told what to do. Well, I was told what to do when I first started serving in church. My dad was a pastor of a rather small church, about 100 people uh, in Richardson, Texas. And we used to arrive at church at 7 a.m., my brother and I, when we were real small. And uh, our job at church was we were the janitors. So I showed up to church every Sunday, uh, and I got to clean the bathrooms. How many of you guys know people are messy? And some people are nasty. And some people have terrible aim. And you're like, why? It's right there. Like, you, like the trash, the urinal, the toilet. Like it's all right there. And then sometimes I feel like people just stood in front of the mirror and just like splashed water. They just threw it up there just for fun. And you're like, why? So that was my job. I was voluntold. Can I tell you, an 11-year-old does not want to clean bathrooms. But that was my serving space. That's where I started. You see, the first thing I've, as we look at Scripture, is this, is that Jesus, Jesus modeled, meaning he lived his life serving, not volunteering. Serving, not volunteering. Jesus never modeled a volunteer behavior. He modeled a serving behavior. I'm sure in heaven... God didn't go, hey, I need somebody to go die on a cross. Anybody want to sign up? But actually God comes to Jesus and sends Jesus down to earth to die for us, to serve us. Do you know that volunteering is not in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible do you see the word volunteering. But you see the word servant 1,100 times. How many of you know if somebody says something 1,100 times, they're trying to get a certain point across? Now, here's the challenge in our society. We are conditioned to volunteer, whether it's you're volunteering at your kid's school, whether it's volunteering with a, a certain political party, whether it's volunteering at the Humane Society, whether it's volunteering uh, at a city park to pick up trash, whether you have been forced to volunteer because you got a ticket and you were assigned vol uh, community service. How many of you guys know the minute your community service is done, you are done volunteering? I put my 30 hours in, I'm done. But Jesus doesn't teach that. You see, a volunteer will serve only when it fits their agenda. A servant serves even when it goes against their agenda. A volunteer will give their time if they have time, but servants make time. Volunteers will volunteer if it's convenient. If it fits within their schedule, if it's something they like to do, if there's enough guilt applied for them to go, okay, I'll give you a couple hours. Servants serve even when it's massively inconvenient. Volunteers have a limit. 
Okay, I've put my time in. I've served my couple hours. I did my thing. I served one service. I did a little bit here. But servants don't ask when it's over. Servants are going, hey, I'm here until you don't need me anymore. Servants are going, this is my life. I'm here to build. I'm here to serve. I'm here to do whatever is needed. And here's the challenge is we find this and you can know whether you're a volunteer or a servant is this. When you're treated like a servant and you stay, you got a servant's heart. When you're treated like a volunteer and you quit, it was always according to your agenda. Disclaimer, can I give it real quick? You with me, 1130? Disclaimer, this does not give permission to ministries and pastors to take advantage of people. We all know the stories of churches that take advantage of people's good hearts and wanting to make things possible, right? And we serve people into the ground. Can I tell you that Jesus taught just, about, about, just as much about honor as he did about serving. So this isn't for people who have walked through situations like that and, and we use common language like burnout or church hurt and all that kind of stuff. This is not an excuse to take advantage of people. But it is an invitation to go, if we're going to be like Jesus, we got to behave like Jesus. And Jesus never volunteered. He served. Servants will put people and purpose over preference. I'd love to tell you a story about a man in our church who has a servant's heart. There's quite a few people in our church that do. But I'd love to introduce you to a man named G. Jones. G. Jones, they're going to put a picture of him on the screen. There he is, G. Jones. G. is a massive OU fan that lost a bet. And uh, G. has served four pastors at this church. G. Uh, has probably one of the toughest jobs in serving at our church because he has to listen to me three times. Um, every service, he has to give me amens and preach it. And some of y'all are like, man, one service is hard enough to get through. Man, how does he do three? But, but G is here. And G serves. One of the things that G does for me is that uh, I love to do lobby time and connect with people. And I asked G, I said, G, I need you to get me to new people because I want to meet new people who come into our church. So G will move me in and out of conversations to be able to meet new people. The second thing that G does for me is... Every week, he types out the conversations that uh, I have with people, whether it's prayer needs or whether it's something in their life or, or something's going on. He types that out so it, it helps me remember. In fact, I just met a new guest this morning, and G helped me with this at the 10 o'clock service. I met them, and I go, hey. They were like, yeah, it's our first time. We've been watching you online for a while. We decided to make the jump. We love this church. It's amazing. It's so good in person as it is online. And I was like, that's awesome. I go, are you new to the area? They said, yeah, we just moved from Houston. I go, oh, wow, where did you move to? Uh, uh, moved in the area. Are you in uh, Pflugerville, Hutto? And they're like, actually, we're in Round Rock. I go, oh, I'm in Round Rock, too. And uh, I go, I actually live at University and A.W. Grimes. They say, we do, too. And I go, what neighborhood? They said my neighborhood. And I was like, oh, my goodness, we need to catch up. Let's have you over for dinner. G was able to help me with that. Here's the cool thing. Here's why I love G. G lost his wife to cancer last January, and we walked with him through that. And this church family came around him and prayed with him and loved him. Here's the crazy thing. G was at our church just a few weeks later. I said, G, what are you doing? G, you just lost your wife. G, take some time. G, like, take a rest. You don't have to be here. And G told me, he said, I would never miss it. This is my purpose. This is where I'm here. I'm not skipping. This is where I find life. I need to be in. Can we honor G? G is one story of many people here who serve, who serve. So Jesus modeled servanthood, not volunteerism. Jesus' expectation, the second thought I have for you today is this, is that everyone serves. Jesus' expectation was never that some serve and some get served. Jesus' expectation was some consume and some contribute. Jesus' expectation when building out this church was this, that every person plays a part in serving. Acts chapter 3, or sorry, Acts chapter 6, verse 3. It says, therefore, brothers, 
pick out from among you seven good men or seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. I love that in Acts, they did not have a sign-up sheet. They were voluntold. Stephen was voluntold. Stephen, you are going to take care of the widows and you're going to serve the tables to make sure everybody is taken care of. If this was a good old Baptist church, they would put a committee together to determine how they're going to sign up and then the committee would vet the sign-ups and then they would have to go through a class. Come on, somebody, right? Like, that's not happening in the first century church. You see, the church is growing. That's a good problem. I don't know if you looked around. Our church is growing. That's a good problem. And when you grow, you go through growing pains. It becomes a lot for a small group of people to handle. In fact, I was talking to somebody a few months ago, and they said, our church is getting too big. And I said, okay, do you want me to limit it? I was joking. She thought I was serious. And she said, yeah, that'd be great if you could just like set a max and no and I was like, okay, well, you're the first one that doesn't get a seat. <laughs> I said to this individual, I said, politely, I said, imagine if it was your loved one, your son or daughter, your family member, your friend you've been praying for, and they walk into this church and we go, I'm sorry, you can't come to our church. We're too full. We hit our max membership. That's what country clubs do, y'all. That's not what the church does. We're saying everybody, anyone, come in. I don't care what race. I don't care what creed. I don't care what sin. I don't care what brokenness. You come to the house of God and we will make room for you. If that means you got to sit in the lobby, if that means you got to sit in the rows, if that means you got to sit in your husband's lap, Come on, marriage series. We're going to make it work. But in that, there's people to serve. And Romans chapter 12, verse 5 and 6 says this. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. And individually members, one of other, another. We're connected. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us Use them. Well, some of you need to touch your neighbor and say, let us use them. There is gifts and gold and Holy Spirit anointing inside of you that is dormant. That is dormant. Some of your gifts are as old as the canned goods in the back of your cupboard <laughs> that you should have thrown away. But you keep thinking, I need black beans one day, so I'm going to keep it up there. My wife went to Costco a few months ago, and I have 12 cans of tomato paste. I do not use that much tomato paste in a decade. But we got tomato paste. Here's my question. What gift is dormant in the body because you have not stepped in and begun to use it? God has graced you with gift. He's given you purpose. He's given you meaning. And when you do not apply them, you deprive the church of your brilliance. Dopamine, in our current context and culture, causes us to only look to what will provide pleasure. And in the pursuit of that pleasure, we find ourselves more unhappy than before. The leading cause of anxiety in America right now, scientists are believing, is the overindulgence in dopamine. In fact, the overexposure and overindulgence in dopamine actually raises the base level of anxiety. There's this thing called homeostasis where your body tries to stay in balance, and it's in other areas of your body as well. It has to do with the metabolic rate, but also in other spaces of your mind and the chemical production in your mind. And what ends up happening is that when it becomes an overindulgence of dopamine and you only look for pleasure, those pleasure centers no longer provide the same pleasure, so you need more and more and more and more and more and more and more, and it gets extreme. That's why pornography actually ruins your intimate relationships with your spouse. 
you become uninterested in your spouse or unfortunately, even unable to perform with your spouse because of the overriding dopamine addiction that constantly hits you. Social media ruins all normal human connections because you've spammed dopamine over and over and over again and you've become, you've become overindulgent into this space. That's why, that's why today there, there are certain people that can't even have a human conversation. They can't, they can't talk to somebody. Like there was somebody the other day that told me that there was a guy that actually in person asked another girl out. And I was like, wow, that's a unicorn. <laughs> that like doesn't happen anymore. Now dudes just like slide in. I tell guys all the time, walk up to her and go, hi, I find you attractive. I would like to buy you dinner. And they're like, what? I can't do that. Like, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, I'll react to a few posts she does, and then like, I'll make some comments, and then I'll DM. And I'm like, you're a human. Have a human conversation. Ladies, amen? But then also ladies are all like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Click, my, click my like to buy. You know, like whatever it is. Food. That's why we, we overindulge in food. Not just because... We're, we want all the calories, but because of what it does in our mind. Yeah. Come on, think about it, right? Nobody has just one slice of pizza. That's an appetizer. <laughs> Nobody has one donut. I'm just warming up, especially if it's Krispy Kreme and it's warm, like I'm having it. But I can have one piece of broccoli. <laughs> Denial and pain is a path to a healthier life. Why did Jesus say this? Deny your life and you will find it. Live for your life and you will lose it. And, and scientists are actually finding, this is so cool, they're, they're finding what scripture has always affirmed. They're finding one of the healthiest ways to release dopamine, the good pleasure, good habit, okay, do this, this is good. The reward center in your mind. The, the, they're finding that this, one of the healthiest ways is this, the kindness effect. They're finding what the Bible has for millennia have been trying to get people to do. And now they're like, oh, we're so clever. We found something new. And every Christian's like, bro. They're saying this, if you will just do an act of kindness for someone who you don't know and can't give anything back to you, it releases a dopamine that lasts longer than the normal pleasure centers. But they're finding this. They're saying there's a catch. Scientists are like writing this. It's so cool. I can imagine them like, we've got this new clever discovery. And scientists are great. We need them. I love science. I lean into this kind of stuff. I just love to see how God created us. And they're saying this, but you have to do it every day. Man. I was hoping I could do it like once a year and get my feel good. But that's why Jesus says you must die to yourself daily. So husband, serve your wife. Wives, serve your husbands. Neighbors, friends that live in an apartment complex or a neighborhood, maybe you're so mad the guy that never mows his lawn, why don't you serve and you go mow his lawn? Hey, where's my students, my parents? Where, where are my teenagers? Y'all right here? Serve your parents. Yeah, okay, that was a free one. That was a free one. Parents, serve your kids. Love them. Service is the antidote to self-indulgence. Let me show you the results of serving. This comes from scripture, so you can see it right here. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So again, good problem. Church is growing. Problem is solved because Stephen is voluntold. Then look what happens. The word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied. My question for you today is this. Does the world have a spiritual problem or does the church have a serving problem? Because if the church began to serve to its fullest potential, 
it says this, that the word of God increased and the disciples multiplied. I just believe that as our church catches this heart and we begin to serve and we begin to lean in, I believe that the sky's the limit in this area for how many people we can reach for the glory of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to reach as many people as possible in my lifetime. So here's my challenge. What if uh, I implemented a new policy that if you were going to come to church here, you were going to have to serve? Like that's just the rule of Victory City Church. If you come to church here, I'm not talking like your first time, but like if this is your home and this is where you go to church, if I implemented a rule that you cannot come to church unless you serve, my question for you would be this. Would you join a team or would you find a new church? Would you find a new church where you could sit and just be able to, okay? And I believe that there's seasons where we do need to receive, where we do need to kind of, okay, let's readjust. But I think in every believer, there's a moment where God kind of taps the window of your car. It's kind of like when you merge in lanes in the highway, have you ever done this? And, and you have to merge in and there's somebody in the lane that won't let you merge in and you're like looking at them. And they know that you know but they're not looking at you because if they look at you, that means they have to let you in. So they just ignore you. Y'all ever been there? You're like trying to merge, right? And you're like looking over, like trying to get, and they're just staring straight ahead or they're looking at their phone, but they feel you. They feel you. Like I-35 from 45, you're trying to like merge, right? And you're trying to get there. Here's the deal. God's trying to merge in. And you're just like, uh, no, I don't, and like I'm just, I'm just going to pretend he's not there because then I don't have to make room for him. I don't have to make room for him. So if I just act like he's not there, then I can just keep going down the road how I want to go, and I don't have to let him in. And some of us in the area of serving, we're just ignoring him. We're pretending we're being on our phone. We're jamming out to music. Maybe we're even spiritual, and we got worship music playing, and Jesus is like, eh, 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 let me in. So every week I've, I've landed something practically. It's been amazing, the response. In fact, this Saturday, we've got almost 180 people coming to, to our Better Together Marriage sa Saturday and relationship. It's amazing. Last week, we had almost 50 people sign up for Financial Peace University. So many of you, you downloaded and began to follow the worship playlist uh, for VCC. Some of you downloaded the, DV, D, the Devo and been working through that. So here's my practical next step. Today, in the lobby, you saw it when you came in. We have the eight areas that you can begin serving in our church. Now, I can't force you to do anything. But my question for you today is this, is will you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to the right spot? Just jump in the river. Just get in. And, and here's the thing. If I'm honest with you, can I have an honest moment as your pastor? If every person in our church who called Victory City Church their home, if they began to serve, we wouldn't know what to do with you. Because there'd be so many. There'd be so many of you. But here's what I would like the opportunity to do. I would like the opportunity to solve that problem. Because in life, you're always solving the problem of I have too much or I have too little. And I just believe that a church that's on fire, believing in the mission of Christ, fully surrendered to Christ, allowing their lives to be transformed by Christ, I would like the problem of trying to solve how do we empower, how do we mobilize, how do we send into ministry, how do we equip, how do we send out and say, God, use us, because I believe that the church should be reaching more and more people. Why do I believe that? Because if I call upon the name of Jesus... I understand this, that Jesus, Jesus, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, take this cup from me. But then he prays, not my will, but your will be done. What was he doing? He was serving you and I. When Jesus took the 39 stripes of the cat of nine tails on his back, what was he doing? He was serving you and I. When he carried his own cross halfway through Jerusalem, but he collapsed because his physical body was unable to carry the cross anymore, what was he doing? He was serving you and I. When they put a crown of thorns on his head and they spat at him and made fun of him and gave him vinegar to drink, vinegar to drink because he was so thirsty, what was he doing? He was serving you and I. When his hands were pierced and his, his feet were pierced and he, and he was hung on the cross and they're slumping and he was praying even in the moment of his sacrifice, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. What was he doing? He was serving you and I. 
when he breathed his last breath and the spear was placed in his side and out from that hole came water and blood, which is symbolic of life and forgiveness. What was he doing? He was serving you and I. As a follower of Jesus, I want to be more like Jesus. If that means there's opportunity to serve and to give my life, I want to be more like Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. If you bow your heads with me as a moment of prayer today, if you're in the room and you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with him, you're not following him, you, you would look at those three areas of discipleship and you would say, that is not me. The first step for you is to surrender your life to Jesus. Jesus can't transform you until you've surrendered to him. He can't work in your life. He can't help you. He can't redeem you until you first take the step of admission of God, I need you. And if you're in the room today with every head bowed and every eye closed, I do that just so you could focus on you. And as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in your heart today, I ask you to respond to that. And if you're here today and, and you want to step into a relationship with Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do so. And on the count of three, wherever you're at, will you just slip your hand up? I want to pray over you and lead you in a salvation prayer. But if that's you, on the count of three, just put your hand up. One, two, three. Just lift it up. Yeah, hand, 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 hand. Praise hands, 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 hands in the back, hands in the back. There's probably 25 hands in the room. If you raise your hand, just put them back down. I want to just lead you in this prayer. Say, Jesus, today I surrender to you. You can have it all. Come into my life, come into my heart, and help me follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins so that I could have a life forever with you. Today, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and I commit to you that I will follow you. Even in my weakness, I will follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.